several of you might remember that this was the movie starring Christopher Reeves and marveled at how powerful this individual was. How that individual came to this earth and had what we would call superhuman strength. In fact, I think we all kind of marvel at that, no pun intended, in the sense that all of the Marvel characters out there in the Marvel movies deal with individuals who are stronger due to some reason than the average human. But interestingly enough, one of the things that I'm reminded of, as strong as Christopher Reeves was in the movie, we recognize his frailty now. Now, I'm not belittling that at all. I'm just utilizing that as an example for one of the things that I want to talk to us about this morning. I think inside of us, we have this desire to be more than we are. At times, we have a desire to be what we would call superhuman, hence by the sort of famousness or the multitudes that are flocking to these movies. Now, they're not bad. They're good. But I also think that that's an innate aspect of who we are as individuals, wanting to be more than we are. With that, though, I want to take a minute, and I want to ask just a quick question. Why should we realize our limitations and then embrace an all-powerful God? Think through this for a minute. I just want to ask you over the last several weeks, how often have you done things in your own strength or by your own power? Or better yet, how many of you have said, well, I'm going to take a little bit of God, but a whole lot of me, and not essentially drawn back and said, let an all-powerful God do what only an all-powerful God can do. This morning, we're studying essentially the aspect of, or the character of God, that is known as omnipotent, or omnipotent, all-powerful. And with that, I pray this morning that we would see that as we worship an all-powerful God, there are great things that can come from it, but there are also a few things that we need to be careful of. One of the things that I think is also important for us to see is that when we realize our limitations, we begin to fully embrace an all-powerful God. John Piper says this, Sleep is a daily reminder from God that we are not God. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. This sickness is chronic tendency to think that we are in control and that our work is indispensable. To cure us of this disease, God turns us into helpless sacks of sand once a day. Think about that for a minute. How many of you have pulled an all-nighter? How well has that gone for you the next day? For me, I remember in college, there were a few times when I would pull an all-nighter, and unfortunately, one time, I didn't time it really well. Pulled an all-nighter to study for an exam, and then in the middle of the exam, I began to realize that my all-powerful coffee wasn't so powerful anymore, and I began to realize my limitation. Now, we say that with humor, but behind this is to help us to recognize that there are moments in our lives where what we want to do is essentially say, God, I've got this, or let me do this in my own strength. Or, at times, what we'll discover in a minute is we prescribe God's power and think that we know what God is doing behind the power that he displays. And sometimes that can become dangerous. The first thing that I want us to see is this, that we have a limited amount of resources and energy that must be replenished. That's just a physical true fact of who we are. I don't know about you, but I like sleep. I also will tell you, and I think that we would all agree, that we can go for a period with shorter amounts of rest. But we also know psychologically that when we do, we begin to become what we would call tired confused, more easily agitated, or angered. We make poor choices when we what? Sleep. 
aren't rested. And so what I'm doing here is just to remind us all that we are not all powerful. We are not able just to continue going and going and going. We need our rest. And that's a reminder to us that in that rest, we also need to rest in God. Think about this for a minute. Through your week, through this last month, I want to ask a very serious question of you. How many of you have rested in God, in the all-powerful God, and just stayed there? How many of you have gone through your week saying, okay, God, do what you need to do, but do it on my time frame, according to my schedule, according to my strength, and according to my ability? We're going to, in a moment, go through some scripture, but I'm laying a foundation for us that I pray that we will see that oftentimes, myself included, we tend to push God out of the way. Or we tend to say, God, you are all powerful, but work your power according to my agenda, my purposes, or what I desire. And sometimes God will, and sometimes he does, but other times God doesn't, and we don't understand that. And we begin to say, well, God must not be very powerful there. Or is there a God? And lovingly, what I want to tell us is, is that if God is all-powerful, and God is always present, as we've learned before, and God is a caring and loving God, and God is with us, etc., 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 then it begins to lay a foundation for us that in those moments where we don't feel God's power, or we don't agree with how God's power may or may not have been displayed, that God is still God. And he still is an almighty, powerful king who has made his promises and is working to bring them about to fruition in manners that will draw people to himself and trusting that indeed that he is doing so. I want to take a minute and just remind us that we do have a limited amount of resources and an energy that must be replenished. But, as we discover in Jen Wilkins' book, this is what she says about our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, on the other hand, never requires to be roused from slumber. Think about that for a minute. He never requires to be roused from slumber. I'm reminded of Psalm uh, 121, which is essentially the sovereignty of God. Kind of a reminder that God is on the job 365 days a year, 366, if you want to include leap year. That he's never at rest. Now, we go back to Genesis and we realize that God rested, but he didn't do it because he was tired. He didn't do it because he was exhausted. He did it because it's part of a command for us to rest in him. God doesn't sleep. His eyes never close in sleep. His thoughts never wander with fatigue. And this is kind of a silly thing, but... I have this kind of thought in my head. Some of you have might have seen it on a Facebook post um, that there's a kind of time when you're counseling and there's a coffee cup and it says basically, I might be listening to you, but in my head I'm actually skiing. <laughs> now, I, I say that just for humor, but sometimes to be honest with you, I'm fatigued. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm not utilizing that this as an excuse. But oftentimes, how often do we have to either multitask or we're distracted or we have an element of fatigue. And the reminder there to you as we worship an all-powerful God is he's not fatigued. Jokingly, again, I don't want to, but he's not skiing in his head when you're talking to him. He is listening to you. He cares for you deeply, intimately, and personally, and he is an all-powerful God. His arms never grow too weary to support and protect. His arms never grow too weary to support and protect. 
I won't go too far into this, but I believe right now as we're looking in the world, we're wondering, where is God? As we look at some of the things that are transpiring around the world, as we're seeing essentially the happenings in Afghanistan, it's obvious that individuals are saying, where is God? Has God dropped the ball? And what I want to tell you is is that if God is all-powerful and God is always present and God has made his promises, God has not dropped the ball. He never grows weary to support and protect. Our Heavenly Father is strong and perpetually so. He never becomes weak. Interesting enough, you say, well, wait a minute. Right? What about the weakest moment that we see Jesus hanging on the cross? He was obviously weak there, wasn't he? And to the world, it would appear that he was so. It would appear that death had overcome Jesus, that he became weak, that he wasn't able to accomplish his mission. But friends, what we see is in the most worldly weak moment of Jesus, it's the most powerful display of his sovereignty as well as his omnipotence. Friends, Jesus didn't succumb to death. He overcame it. And on the cross, as he hangs on it, as he hangs on it and the world says he's dying, Jesus is atoning for our sins. And at the right time that is appointed by the Father through Christ, Jesus says, it is finished. And then he... And he alone, by his almighty power, as only God can do, gives up his spirit. He doesn't succumb to death. God is always in control of this. God is always over this. And as the world says, that's the weakest moment of Jesus. How can you worship such a weak king? God in his word says, that's the most powerful display of my omnipotence. Because in death, of which we all will succumb, I am an all-powerful God who will not succumb to death so that you might have eternal life. That's omnipotence, friends. That's the God whom we worship. And so with that, while we have a limited amount of resources and energy that must be replenished, we also recognize that we worship a God who is all-powerful and sustains all things through his powerful word. That's who we worship. And how he does so is through his powerful word. The word spoken in scripture. The promises given that we see from Genesis to Revelation. Hebrews 1.3 says this, the sun, meaning obviously Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. We worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for those that might try to belittle Jesus, for those that might try to say, well, Jesus was a good guy, or Jesus was better than a good guy, he was a political leader, or Jesus was better than a good guy and better than a political leader, he was a prophet, or Jesus was this amazing person that gives us insight into how we are to live our lives. The word says no. He's the exact representation of the Father. He is all-powerful God. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. As we walk through scripture, we see moments where God speaks and it is. We see God breathe life into being. We see God speak and give the breath of life to us. We see Jesus say to a storm, be still, and the storm is still. Those are the all-powerful words of an all-powerful God, an omnipotent God of whom we worship. And so one of the things that I want to encourage us in is this. If God can do it then, he can certainly do it now. If it is his will.
And so as we go through our lives, as we see the world in its tumultuous state, as we see what's transpiring, friends, what I want to tell you is this, that God is not caught off guard. God is not reaching for the sidelines. God is not looking for an audible. God is not saying, I've messed up. God is not saying, I'm too tired. God is not saying, I'm busy right now. Call me back later. God is not saying, there's too much going on. I simply can't multitask. God is not saying, this is too hard for me. I can't do it. He's an all-powerful, almighty God who holds everything in the palm of his hand. Trying to describe God's omnipotence, his all-powerfulness, A.W. Tozer says this, Since he has, at his command, all power of the universe, so just stop there for a minute before we go into this. Since he has, at his command, okay, he possesses all power, not some power, not partial power, not distributed power, not democratic power, but all power at his command in not just a part, but the universe, all created order. The Lord God is omnipotent, can do anything as easily as anything else, if he chooses, essentially is what's being stated. All his acts are done without effort. That's so contrary to our thinking. It's so contrary to what we think, that when we act, we exhort energy, we exhort things, and after doing so, we become tired, or we essentially reduce our strength. He extends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. That's an omnipotent God. All the power required to do all that he will do lies in the undiminished fullness in his own infinite being. Put quite simply, Jesus doesn't need an energy drink to keep going because he is that energy drink. He is an all-powerful God. And if the all-powerful God whom we worship has said he will do what he will do, our job is to rest and trust that he will and that he is able and that he is all-powerful. And so with that, what I want to do is I want to move to the book of Ephesians. And if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at a passage um, sort of uh, toward the latter part of this chapter. But before we dive in, I just want to sort of uh, lay the context of what's going on. Paul is talking essentially in the first several verses about the spiritual blessings in Christ. And he's telling those who know Jesus as well as those who do not what we have because of what Jesus has done. And in that, he says, now that we know this, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to extend a prayer, a prayer to the people of God, a prayer to the, to the church, that they would see and recognize this. And so, as I've said before, that we worship a God who is all-powerful and sustains all things through his powerful word. The idea behind this is, therefore, may we submit to the power and authority of the mighty God we serve. Paul starts off in verse 15 of chapter 1 in the book of Ephesians, and he says, because of the blessings we have in Christ, that's the context, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Real quick, for those of you that are grammarians, this whole passage is one long, run-on sentence in Greek. Why? 
because it's the explanation of the prayer as well as who God is. It's interesting that this whole concept is one subject, one thought of many that can't be fully described in one word. It continues on, and it says, I keep asking that the Lord of our God, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes uh, of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope of which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and in his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. And every title that has been given, not only to the present age, but the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This passage right here is a sermon in and of itself. But a couple of things that I want to draw to your attention. The main gist, the two kind of main ideas that are happening within this prayer is, number one, essentially Paul is saying, may we gain deep insight into the Lord's powerful working. May we gain insight into his powerful working. But what is that? Well, Paul's prayer, he says, okay, what I want to do is I want to first give thanks to you. I want to let you know that you're important to me. But also in my prayers, I keep asking, right, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you this spirit of wisdom and revelation. For what purpose? So that you may know Him better. Friends, what I want to ask lovingly to all of us right now is, what are we asking of God when we ask him to essentially empower us? Are we asking it so that we can get what we want, how we want, and when we want? Are we asking it so that we can have our own ideas and our own thoughts expressed or validated and then put God behind those thoughts? Or are we going and saying to God, the reason that I want to do this is so that I might know you better? And then lovingly, how do we know him better? Well, we go back to Hebrews through his word, through Christ, which we know God has given Christ all power and has expressed and manifested that through his word, scripture, as well as Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and in God, and through God. And then it continues on. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope of which he has called you. And so what Paul's doing is he's saying, I'm praying and asking that we would gain deep insight into the Lord's powerful working but as well in that, that we would know the rich gifts in Christ. Well, what are those rich gifts? What's the purpose behind the power of God displayed here? And he continues on and he says this. Verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope of which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I want to pause there for a minute. Don't miss this. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Think about that for a minute. Yes, we inherit it. And when we become followers of Jesus, we inherit God's kingdom. But that's not what's being said here. 
What's being said here is, is that Paul is praying that we would see how much and how passionate God is about you and I and his creations, the saints, whom he will inherit in his kingdom. That's the focus of what's going on here. I pray that also the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope of which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. What is that power? It's the power to raise the dead to life. It's the power to raise those who are spiritually dead without hope to an everlasting life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's power. The only person and God that I know that can do that is Jesus. And the only reason that Jesus can do so is because God is full, or Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he is all powerful. Friends, may we gain a deep insight into the Lord's working, but may we also realize the rich gifts that we have in Christ. Number one, it's our salvation. Number one, it's the fact that we've been raised from death to life through the one who died to give us life, and that's Jesus. And oftentimes, I think that we tend to forget that or we tend to take that for granted. And friends, lovingly, I do it myself. I want to ask a question that I ask of myself sometimes. Is it enough for an all-powerful God to raise me from death to life so that I might have eternal life through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And should that power never be displayed in the manner that I hope or I want or I think in this world, that power is enough. Because the only one who can do so is the all-powerful Lord, Jesus. But then it continues on. And it says in verse 19, And his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength. Interesting. That power is like the exertion of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I find it interesting that that essentially follows what happened to Jesus. I've said earlier that the world would say that the weakest moment of Jesus was when he hung like a criminal on a cross, succumbing to death. And I said earlier that Jesus didn't succumb to death. He overcame it after he atoned for our sins. He gave up his spirit. That's power. When he was ready and when it was done because he's an all-powerful God. But also, this all-powerful God had the ability to what? Raise Jesus from the dead to prove that he triumphed over sin and death and brings eternal life to all whom will believe. But not only that, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father in authority and in glory. And we know that Christ will come again at the appointed time that the Father says. It's all under control. But interesting enough, just so that we continue to recognize this, he says in verse 20, I'll kind of pick up there, uh, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Friends, what I want to tell you right there is, is that kingdoms will come and kingdoms will fall. Nations will rise and nations will fall. Presidents will come and presidents will fall. Administrations will come and administrations will fall. But the one who will not is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is all-powerful and has authority and dominion over all. All. 
And so in that, friends, when we become concerned or confused and wonder if God is working, he is always working and he is always in control and he is always all-powerful no matter what is transpiring on a global level. Verse 21, for above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the age to come. Speaking to the today, essentially speaking to the now, which is what we are in, but also in the age to come, which is sort of the echoing or sort of this movement toward the kingdom, that when God's kingdom comes, Jesus will be all-powerful because he is all-powerful, period. There isn't a transition of administration. There isn't a change of government. There isn't a change of authority because Jesus is authority over all and is all powerful. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. Let's take a moment. Christ has been appointed as the all-powerful authority. And we've been placed under Jesus. But also, what a joy it is that we are the body. But not only is it a joy that we are the body, perfectly, hopefully, as the body, we're not Jesus, but we express the fullness of him. who fills everything in every way. (coughs) Friends, the church is you and I. God's given the church to us. Now, we're not in control. We're not above God. But God's entrusted the church to you and I, and he's given us the Holy Spirit that indwells us to lead, guide, direct, and counsel us. And we have an all-powerful God who stands with us and leads and guides and directs us in our lives. And so when things happen, when things appear to be out of control, when things seem to be different, when things happen that we may not understand, that we may not like, that we may not agree with, that we may not want, the question is this. If we are the church, and we are the body of Christ, and we express the fullness of Christ, we're not Jesus, but we express the fullness of Christ, then do we trust an all-powerful God to lead us? Father, I pray that as we look, we realize that we would submit to the power and authority of the mighty God that we serve, that we would gain deep insight into the Lord's powerful working and the rich gifts in Christ. But when things don't go the way that we think they should, or the way that we necessarily understand, that we would not go and say that God is not in control or question his authority we would realize that God is king and God is all-powerful. It's a prayer that Paul gives. It's a prayer of encouragement. It's a prayer of challenge. It's a prayer of of blessing. And with it, I pray that we would realize that really as we understand God's power, we find it through his word. We find it in scripture. We look to the promises that God has given and we trust what is there. Which leads me to kind of my next aspect, where sometimes we can take the authority of God and prescribe it in a way that isn't God's working. One of the things that I would say is this. While we submit to the, authority of, uh, the power and authority of the God we serve, may we be careful not to presume the purpose of how God chooses to use his power Where am I going with that? Well, let's turn to Job 26, 1 through 14. Job is a story, obviously, of an individual who is kind of God's number one 
A student, for lack of a better word. Job loves the Lord. But what we come to, dis to discover in this story is that the enemy goes to God and says, hey, here's the deal. The only reason that Job loves you is because things are good. If things go wrong, if things go poorly, if they don't go the way Job expects, I'm going to tell you, God, that Job is going to curse your name. And the only reason that he worships you is because you're good to him. And so, unbeknownst to Job, unbeknownst to the world below, God works an aspect out with the enemy and says, okay, you can do what you need to do to my servant, but there are a few things that you cannot do. And then the story moves forward. And Job's life goes from what? Really good to really, really bad quickly. And in that, you would think that Job would say, if God is all-powerful, then why is this happening to me? But what we discover through the story of Job is that Job never curses God. He continues to trust God. But interestingly enough, Job has a couple of buddies. Bildad, Elphaz, and Zophar. And Bildad, Elphaz, and Zophar are Job's friends. And they go through a series of speaking to Job. They go through these triads as we walk through the book of Job. And essentially what they do is, is they go to Job, and I'll kind of summarize it. It's a little deeper in this, but the summary is this. Hey, we figured it out, Job. The reason that your life is so messed up is because you're doing something wrong. You've sinned. You're the one who's wrong. You need to change. And if you do, we figured that this is what God is going to do. So Job, figure it out and do your thing. And essentially, okay, read the rest of the story, but that's the gist. And they keep coming back to Job, and one speaks, and the next speaks, and the next speaks. And Job is just sitting there going, I haven't done anything. I love God. Why are you presuming to tell me how God is using his power and his authority? And so we kind of get to this last part. And interestingly enough, you go through these triads, and Bildad speaks, and then the next individual will speak. But Bildad gets about halfway through what he's saying in chapter 25. And then finally, Job just kind of has enough. Okay? He just gets frustrated. And this is what he starts to say. He says, in replying to Bildad, but also the others, How have you helped the powerless? Have you saved the arm that is feeble? What advice you have offered to one without wisdom? And what great insight have you displayed? Who has helped you utter those words? And whose spirit spoke from your mouth? Essentially, he's just challenging them. He's frustrated. But he's saying, hey, before you tell me what God is doing to me, are you sure that God told you this? And then he says, the dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. So what he does, okay, he kind of goes to them and says, who, who do you, not necessarily, kind of who do you think you are, but how do you know, beyond a shadow of doubt, that God is doing this and God said, this is what I'm doing? Are you sure that that's how God is using his power? And then the following verses, he displays the depth and the breadth of the power of God, helping us to see that we get glimpses, we get inklings, we get sort of the surface level aspects but we can never fathom the depths of our all-powerful God and his purposes. The dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the water and all that live in them. 
Death is naked before God. So what he says is, hey, we, we get to see sort of death and we kind of get to see the aspect there. But before God, it's naked before him. Destruction lies uncovered. He's the one who spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters uh, in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. So he's kind of saying, we get a surface glimpse, but God is the one who does all of these things beyond our understanding and beyond our ability or our authority. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out on the horizon, on the face of the waters, for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of the heavens quake against, uh, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he turned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab into pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but, okay? So all of these things that we've seen just a little bit that he's done, I'm going to summarize, okay? That's what Job is doing. And all of these, all of these are but an outer fringe, just a little glimpse to demonstrate his power, but it's not how deep and promising and the purpose behind his power. They're just an outer fringe of his works, how faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then? Who then can understand the thunder of his power? We can see God work. We can see him move. But we're only seeing surface. And interestingly enough, Job is saying, guys, this is the deal. You're telling me that you are presuming that you understand what God is doing. And you understand how he's using his power. And you're telling me that God is using his power because I have sinned. But I have not. And interestingly enough, we come to find at the end of Job, that's the truth. And in it, after Job remains faithful to a God whom is using his power in the way that he deems fit, but does not necessarily have an answer at all to how God is using that power, stays faithful to the God who is all-powerful. My question to us is this. Can we stay faithful to a God who is all-powerful when we don't agree with how God decides to use his power or we don't understand it? Better yet, do we at times tend to ascribe things to say God is using his power for X or Y when we'd have no idea what God is truly using his power for? And friends, lovingly, I'm just encouraging us to be careful that we don't say God's doing X or Y because when God has not told us he's doing X or Y because. Sometimes we may not know. Sometimes we're not supposed to know, as we see in this word. Sometimes we're fortunate enough to get a glimpse, a little bit of an understanding of how God utilizes his power. But we can't plumb the depths of God's power and his purposes. God is God, and we are not. And so with that, when we look at this, when we presume, when we presume, we might get it wrong. Like Bildad, Elphaz, and Zophar. But rather like Job... May we realize that we just get a glimpse of how God uses his power. And like Job, when we don't understand, when we don't get it, when we don't realize it, and when the world isn't going how we think it should, may we trust in the God who does. Because he is all powerful. Friends, this morning we've kind of gone through this question of an all-powerful, omnipotent God 
And the first thing that I've said is that we uh, have a question of why should we realize our limitations and embrace an all-powerful God? And the purpose behind that is, is if we tend to do life on our own, if we tend to think that we can do it on our own, if we think that we need just a little bit of God and a whole lot of us, we will never fully understand the omnipotence of God. But when we are weak, he is strong. When we are at our wit's end, when our power is exhausted, his power is there. Because it's inexhaustible. And so may we remember that we have a limited amount of resources and energy that must be replenished. Number two, though, we worship a God who is all-powerful and sustains all things by his powerful word. And because of that, then, may we submit to the power and authority of the mighty God that we serve. And as we do, may we gain a deep insight into the Lord's powerful working for our salvation, for the joy of the Lord, for understanding who Jesus is, so that we can see and know the rich gifts that we have in Christ. But also lovingly, may we be careful not to presume the purpose of how God chooses to use his power. Because oftentimes when we do, we might get it wrong, like Bildad, Elphaz, and Zophar. And so I pray, like Job, may we realize that oftentimes we just get a glimpse of how God uses his power. If you remember nothing from this, I just encourage you this morning with this. This is what I'd like to encourage us with about the omnipotence of God, particularly in the time that we're in. We should realize our limitations and embrace our all-powerful God so that we don't presume the purposes of God. Yet we gain insight into the powerful works of the Lord and the rich gifts of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this. Father, thank you for these passages as well as many others that deal with your omnipotence. Father, you truly are all-powerful. You truly are the one who can do all things. And so with that, Lord, I pray that we would remember and recognize in those moments where we feel that things might be out of control, where we feel that you're not able to do what we think is impossible, you can. You rose Jesus from the dead. You've given us life in our spiritual blindness and death. You have raised us to life with you throughout eternity in your kingdom. You have created all things. You sustain all things by your word and by your breath. And so with that, Lord, I pray that in peace and in comfort and in rest, we would recognize that we worship a God who is all-powerful. But also, Lord, in the times where he might display his power in ways that we don't understand, may we trust him as he does. But also, Lord, may we not presume to essentially know what God is doing in moments that we don't. May we not presume how God uses his power. Rather, may we trust that he does. With that, Lord, I pray that that would bring peace and encouragement to our hearts, particularly this week and in the weeks and months to come, as we continue to be salt and light for you, your hands and your feet, to those who are around us. We do pray these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask it by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's children say, Amen.